Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. Remember the Romulan cloaking technology in Star Trek? Well, a radio amateur has received a patent for real cloaking technology. Alabama Governor Kay Ivey makes a ham radio debut with the state's new bicentennial call sign. A new ARRL section manager is appointed in North Dakota. Urban Explorers releases a new video that reveals a largely unseen side of the old Hera Arena. Philippine radio amateurs activate for weather emergencies. And radio amateurs continue to expand the limits of the amateur radio hobby. We will tell you all about what some amateurs have achieved in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites orbiting the planet. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, agrees with Elon Musk in that we should be very afraid of the upcoming artificial intelligence systems. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, reveals how amateurs should do no harm. We have a special press release to bring you from the Dayton Hamvention folks. And this week, we present our annual holiday special by the late Gene Shepard, K2ORS, as he talks about his adventures in ham radio when he was just a kid. That's all straight ahead as edition number 983 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our frozen headquarters studio facility here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where the temperature outside is colder than the freezer inside, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from the Rancho Lumbago in the Catskill Mountains, where the wood stove is throwing off 100,000 BTUs on a steady diet of oak, maple, and ash, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from our Central Florida News Bureau, where 52 degrees Fahrenheit is considered a cold spell, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from the heart of Central New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Before we begin this week's newscast, we just learned that one of our own, Will Rogers, K5WLR, who reports here every week, suffered a fall and has a broken ankle. He won't be with us for a few weeks while he recovers, and all of us here at This Week in Amateur Radio wish him well and hope for a speedy recovery. Now, on to this week's news. 20 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Nathan Chip Cohen. W1YW of Belmont, Massachusetts, the founder of Fractal Antenna Systems Incorporated and inventor of the Fractal Antenna, has been granted a patent for deflective electromagnetic shielding, essentially cloaking technology, to defend against detection by radar and similar technologies. Ham radio experimentation can lead to some pretty cool innovations, Cohen said in a response to a recent QRZ forum post about the patent. Let's keep that spirit alive in 2018. The patent covers electromagnetic cloaking deflection of, among other things, satellites, rockets, towers, antennas, vehicles, body coverings, ships, spacecraft, and even people. Much time and effort has been devoted to the quest for so-called invisibility machines. The patent's background information states, beyond science fiction, however, there has been little, if any, real progress toward this goal until now. According to the detailed description, the technology provides one or more surfaces that act or function as shielding and or cloaking surfaces for which at least a portion of the surface includes or is composed of fractal cells. Small fractal shapes functioning as antennas or resonators placed sufficiently close to one another so that current present in one fractal cell is replicated or reproduced to an extent in an adjacent fractal cell. Without being limited by any theoretical explanation, surface plasmonic waves are believed to cause such replication in conjunction with effervescent waves. The resulting surface would deflect around an object. In terms of backscatter, upon which radar systems depend, Cohen has explained it this way. 
The incoming wave reflects off a boundary condition at the object. Its reflection is out of phase and phase cancels with the incoming wave. Bye-bye backscatter. Fractal antenna systems first publicly demonstrated person invisibility in 2012 for a Radio Club of America audience. He also has demonstrated invisibility cloaks at Hamvention and at the AWRL New England Division Convention. According to the company's Business Wire release, uses of the newly patented technology extend to commercial needs such as towers, antennas, people, and shielding, but it may also be used in defense and intelligence arenas. According to the Business Wire release, the technology produces the desired effects without any requirements on special orientation, composition, or shape of the object. The cloak deflector can be very thin and the effect can happen over a wide bandwidth. The company noted that the cloaking applications concentrate on microwave and infrared wavelengths, although the technology and patents apply to visible light as well. Stated Cohen, Cloaking at visible light has limited needs. Camouflage and projection methods are easier and cheaper at making something disappear to the eye. But at radio and heat wavelengths, the cloaking technology is an important enabler. Cohen, who is 62, applied for the patent in 2012. He is an AWRL Life member and active DXer. He has been a radio amateur for more than 50 years. Alabama Governor Kay Ivey made her amateur radio debut on December 14th, the state's 198th birthday, at the same time becoming the first person to use the state's bicentennial call sign, AL2C. Alabama will celebrate its 200th anniversary in 2019, and AL2C will be on the air for two years as part of the statewide celebration. I'm very excited to see the hard work that's been in the works for some time now to promote amateur radio in concert with the Alabama Bicentennial Celebration, said ARRL Alabama Section Manager J. Van Martin, W4JVM, who was at the state capitol for the event. It was great to activate a brand new call sign, AL2C, on Alabama's 198th birthday, and we look forward to many more activities to come as we build up to Alabama's 200th. The Alabama Bicentennial Amateur Radio Club set up a D-Star VHF station in the old house chamber at the Alabama State Capitol in Birmingham. After announcing the Alabama Bicentennial Schools Initiative, Governor Ivey proceeded to the radio station, initiating contact with the Lee County Emergency Management Agency. The governor discussed the Alabama Bicentennial over the air with Otto Arnst and 4 uzz the AL2C call sign trustee, serving as the control operator. Also on hand were Alabama House of Representatives Public Information Officer Clay Redden, KC4YAU, Alabama ARRL Public Information Coordinator Ed Tyler and 4EDT, Watauga County Assistant Emergency Coordinator Trent Davis, KV4UZ, and Alabama Bicentennial Amateur Radio Club Treasurer Jason Smith, W4EGR, along with Alabama ARRL State Government Liaison Christopher Hall, K4LIA, who also serves as Watauga County Aries Emergency Coordinator and as President of the Alabama Bicentennial Amateur Radio Club. Hall established the Alabama Bicentennial Amateur Radio Club and AL2C in July and has been working with the Alabama Bicentennial Commission to promote Alabama's Bicentennial. On the other end of the conversation at Lee County Emergency Management Agency was Mike Watkins, WX4AL, the Delta Aries Emergency Coordinator and Lee County Aries Emergency Coordinator. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. Nancy Yoshida, KG0YL, has been appointed as the ARRL North Dakota Section Manager starting on January 1st, 2018. Yoshida, an ARRL Life member who resides in Thompson, will take the North Dakota Field Organization leadership reins from Lynn Nelson, W0ND, who was selected last month as ARRL Dakota Division Vice Director. Nelson, of Minot, has served as the North Dakota Section Manager since 2008. AWRL Radio Sport Manager Norm Fusaro, W3IZ, appointed Yoshida after consulting with Nelson. Yoshida, who has been the North Dakota Section Emergency Coordinator since 2011, will fulfill the present term of office that continues through September 2018. Yoshida, 
who is 67, has raced sled dogs since 2002, and in 2009 she ran the Iditarod sled dog race in Alaska. She became interested in amateur radio after volunteering for Iditarod in communications in 2006 and continues to be involved with the Iditarod communications team. Reminiscent of underwater footage from a TV documentary about the discovery of a long lost vessel, a recently posted YouTube video takes a deep dive into the innards of the former Hamvention venue Hara Arena and has been attracting notice within the amateur radio community. The narrated video probe was posted December 22nd by Once Occupied, an urban exploration group that originated in Dayton, Ohio. It's not the first video of the derelict Hara Arena since it closed, then anything is sought to be of value inside was auctioned off. The IRS put the Hara Arena complex itself on the auction block last August to satisfy a tax lien, but no successful bidder was ever announced. It's not clear whether the three-person once occupied expedition had permission to be inside the arena, nor how the individuals, who do not identify themselves, gained entry to the building. Among the more fascinating revelations was how much equipment, event paraphernalia, and just plain debris remained inside the 165,000 square foot Hara complex, which included an apartment. This is creepy and surreal, but I couldn't turn it off and I had to watch the whole thing, said Pete Varus, NL7XM, the QCWA's official call sign historian, who shared the video with his colleagues at the QCWA Board of Directors. You'll recognize entire areas that teamed with activity during every hamvention. He continued, it looks like raw footage from Chernobyl after the Russian nuclear disaster. The urban explorers were a bit more mundane. The facilities included a pub bar, a ballroom, a conference center, ice rink, and four exhibition halls. The place is huge. The narrative posted more than a 20-minute video clip. As the once-occupied team noted, Hara Arena over the years has played host to sports teams and top entertainers, including Elton John and the Rolling Stones, as well as to Hamvention. Hara's shutdown in 2016 in part forced Hamvention's move to its current venue at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia. A lot of this particular video covers the parts of the Hara never seen by Hamventioneers, including catwalks, tunnels, behind-the-scenes rooms and facilities, such as offices, kitchen areas, and storerooms, some of which still contained unopened goods and supplies. While cabinets still store paper files and abandoned computers and other equipment are scattered about, at least one box the group encountered contained new t-shirts for a sports team that once made its home there. Some areas of the building's interior seem to have been hit by a tornado. Other explorers didn't appear to take anything from the Hara or disturb what remained behind. Our passion is exploring abandoned places. We explore because we love adventure and the thrill of the hunt, once Occupied says on its Facebook page. Documenting our journeys through digital media allow us to share the stories of the past. The group warns that such exploration is not without risk and not for everyone. A trip to the Gambia in February by students and staffers of the Sandringham School in the UK will include a short the expedition. The call sign C5DX again has been granted and will be on the air February 9th to the 16th. A party of 18 sixth form students and three staff members for the Sandringham School will visit their partner school for a Fenny Senior Secondary High. The two schools have worked in partnership for 10 years, and for Fenny High is now one of the highest achieving rural schools in the Gambia. This will mark a return visit to the Gambia by Sandringham School. A contingent from Sandringham traveled to the Farfenny High last February to open a new school hall there and to activate C5DX. Head teacher Alan Gray, G4DJX, will lead the expedition aspect to the trip. He will primarily operate CW, while four licensed students from the Sandringham School Amateur Radio Club, M0SCY, will operate single sideband. They include Jessica, M6LPJ, Polly, M6POJ, Morgan, M6MXD, and Stan, M6SQO. This will be their first de-expedition, and the youngsters will be learning how to operate from a semi-rare DXCC entity. It's number 198 on the club's log DXCC Most Wanted list. I learned the craft of DX operating. Gray said he may try some low-frequency band operating from the Gambia. The group will take along an Alicraft K3, a KPA500, and a KAT500 combination to run 400 watts into a multi-band dipole. C5DX will operate split up 1 kHz for CW and up 5 kHz for single sideband and will attempt to upload their logs into Logbook of the World and the club log while they are in the Gambia. They also hope to update their QRZ page during the D-Expedition. 
Sandringham School Amateur Radio Club now has 17 amateur radio licensees on their membership rolls, with more waiting to take either foundation or intermediate exams. Part of the visit is a survey of the progress of a major extension to the Farfenny High School Library, made possible through fundraising at Sangreham School. What's your grid square? Be prepared to answer that question a lot in 2018. The AWRL International Grid Chase 2018 begins this weekend and continues throughout the year. The Grid Chase kicks off at 0000 UTC on Monday, January 1, which is the New Year's Eve in the U.S. time zones, so get ready to hit your grid running. This is an event for all radio amateurs, and taking part is as simple as just getting on the air and making contacts. The objective of the year-long event is to work stations on any band, except 60 meters, in as many different maidenhead grid squares as possible, and then upload your logs to ARRL's Logbook of the World. All contacts and all permitted amateur radio bands, except 60 meters, are eligible for award credit. This includes contest contacts. Each new grid square contact confirmed through LOTW will count towards your monthly total. Stations do not have to exchange grid squares for a valid contact, although it's anticipated that many operators will do so. Some grid squares will be rare ones, however, and will be in demand. How about yours? Get on the air and get behind your grid. If you can, get out there and activate scarce ones. Complete details of the ARRL International Grid Tra Chase appeared in the December 2017 issue of QST. For more information, contact the ARRL Contest Branch. Many hams are familiar with grid squares from the VHF, UHF, and satellite realms, and everyone lives in one. An online calculator by David Levine, K2DSL, can determine your grid square. Enter a postal address, zip code, or call sign, and the calculator will return the grid square for that location. Any contact you made in 2018 can count for your chase score. As long as other operates participate, you'll get credit automatically when they upload their logs. This means your contacts will count, as will contacts with special event stations or other on-air activity that uses Logbook of the World to confirm contacts. Except for 60 meters, there is no restrictions on the bands or modes, as long as they are legal. Satellite contacts are valid for the chase, too. The event is open to all radio amateurs. Complete details of the AWRL International Grid Chase appeared in the 2017 issue of QST. For more information, contact the AWRL Contest Branch. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm talking with Bart Yonke, W9JJ, the ARRL Contest Branch Manager. And Bart, we're two weeks away from the beginning of the ARRL International Grid Chase, correct? We sure are, Steve. The uh, International Grid Chase starts on January 1st and runs through December 31st of 2018. This event is going to be open to all amateurs, all license levels, and it's a worldwide event. All contacts count, right? They sure do. Anything and everything. This is really about people getting on the air, operating, making contacts, keeping track of the four-digit maidenhead grid squares that these people operate from, and uploading your logs to Logbook of the World. And how does it work in terms of the monthly scores? We anticipate having uh, on our webpage an analysis at the end of each month of how all participants did during that 30-day period. Starting fresh the next month, scores are set back to zero and people start all over again. This gives people who didn't have a chance to do something in the preceding month, or say January, to get on during February and participate and establish their activity level for that month. Okay, so in other words, coming up at the end of this first month, at the end of January, everybody resets to zero, correct? Exactly. So they operate throughout the entire month of January, make as many contacts as they can, recognizing the various different grid squares that they've worked worldwide on any amateur band accepting 60 meters and on the modes of CW, phone, or digital. And uh, what about satellite contacts? Satellite contacts count, as do moonbounds contacts. Oh, okay, but not terrestrial repeaters, correct? Not terrestrial repeaters. Aeronautical contacts don't count. But if you're uh, working somebody who is maritime mobile and they're using a GPS system to tell what digit, uh, four-digit grid square they're located in, that counts. Now, what if I'm traveling just with my family and I take an HT along with me and I 
get off the plane, get in the hotel, and get on Simplex and make a contact. Does that count? It sure does. Just be sure that you log it. Make sure that you update your logbook of the world TQSL station location. When you upload your log logged contacts, you just need to select the right station location. That TQSL record shows the grid square that you operated from. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to it. January 1st, midnight UTC. Absolutely. Get on. Enjoy. Doesn't matter what size station you have. You're going to have people with small stations and low power all the way to the big stations. They may be operating the contest, might be casual operating. Everything counts because it's all about what you log in Logbook of the World. Very good, Bart. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Trending in this week's news is word that the FCC has imposed a $180,000 civil penalty on a Sarasota, Florida company that had been marketing non-compliant audiovisual transmitters intended for use on drones in violation of the commission's amateur service and marketing rules. In an order released on December 19th, the FCC explained that Luminaire Holdco LLC formerly known as FPV Manuals LLC, was advertising and marketing uncertified AV transmitters capable of operating on both amateur and non-amateur frequencies, including bands reserved for federal government use. Some of the transmitters also exceeded the one-watt power limit for amateur radio transmitters used on model craft, the FCC said. Moreover, entities that rely on amateur frequencies and operating compliant AV transmitters must have an amateur license and otherwise comply with all laws for such operation, the FCC said in the order. The FCC said that while it generally has not required amateur equipment to be certified if it operates solely on amateur radio frequencies, certification is required if a device can operate outside of the ham bands. Last January, in what it called an extremely urgent complaint to the FCC, the AWRL targeted the interference potential of a series of audio-video transmitters used on unmanned aircraft and marketed as amateur radio equipment. AWRL General Counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD, said those transmitters used frequencies intended for navigational aids air traffic control radar, air route surveillance radars, and global positioning systems. In addition to paying a civil penalty, Lumineer, which has admitted to marketing the non-compliant AV transmitters, will enter into a consent decree with the FCC to settle the enforcement proceedings and terminate the investigation. The case stemmed from complaints received by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau's Spectrum Enforcement Division. The investigation revealed that some of the AV transmitters marketed by Lumineer were capable of being operated outside of the authorized amateur radio service bands, including on frequencies reserved in whole or in part for federal agencies, but were not certified or otherwise compliant with the rules, the FCC said in its order. These AV transmitters are considered intentional radiators and must comply with the Commission's equipment authorization and marketing rules. The FCC said that Lumineer ceased marketing the non-compliant transmitters after receiving a letter of inquiry from the FCC last April. The consent decree accompanying the FCC order requires Lumineer to admit that it violated equipment authorization and marketing rules and establish a compliance plan to ensure that the company complies with FCC rules in the future. Philippines Amateur Radio Association's Ham Emergency Radio Operations, or HERO, volunteers assisted with emergency communication support in the wake of two severe weather events. Tropical Storm Kaitak, known as Yerduja hit first in the central Philippines on December 16th, leaving nearly dozens dead and forcing others to evacuate. It was followed on December 22nd by the more severe tropical storm Tembin, known locally as Vinta, which caused significant damage and claimed some 200 lives in the southern Philippines. Hundreds more are reported missing. Robert Vincencio, DU1VHY, said Hero Volunteers provided HF coordination to a national emergency net at 7.095 megahertz. In addition, local clubs embedded with government responders use designated channels and club frequencies. According to Vincencio, Tropical Storm Kaitak ravaged the central Visayas area, holding in place for nearly three days. Much rain was dumped in the Samara and Tacloban areas of central Visayas region, he said. In situations like this, most radio amateurs in the affected areas 
fold into government's regional and provincial disaster risk reduction management offices to consolidate the actions of the amateur and civic groups, as well as military and police forces. Just two days later, Tropical Storm Temin threatened the southern island of Mindanao. Hero reported that it was ready for the storm and able to mobilize the assets of radio amateurs and civic communications groups, as well as of police and armed forces. Vincencio reported that the wind strength and volume of rains inundated Mindanao, taking a direct east-to-west path. Residential areas were hit by flooding and many lost their lives after being trapped indoors by the fast-rising waters. The flooding also took out bridges and roads and devastated farm fields. There was a shortage of communications too, Vincencio reported. Many major transportation arteries were affected, further stranding others who tried to escape. This is said to be just the start of the annual adverse weather season in the Philippines. But, Vincencio said, Hero Network is prepared. Norway has completed a nearly year-long transition to digital radio, becoming the first country in the world to shut down national broadcasts of its analog FM radio network and move to digital audio broadcasting, or DAB. The three state-run outlets, NRK P1-3, and commercial stations P4 and Radio Norge have ceased broadcasting in FM and transmit DAB instead. The switch has not been popular with everyone, but complaints involving technical issues and lack of DAB coverage in Norway. In addition, radio users have complained about the need to buy new receivers or digital adapters. Also, fewer than one half of Norway's motorists have DAB capability. Proponents contend the transition will not only offer better sound quality and more channels, but save money. Radio listening in the Scandinavian country has dropped by 10% over the past year, and public broadcaster NRK has lost 21% of its audience, according to media reports. The switch over to DAB Plus involves only national radio channels. Most local stations still broadcast in analog FM. Other countries in Europe are poised to follow Norway's lead. Finland launched digital broadcasting in 1998, but shut it down seven years later. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Season's greetings. This is W2XBS. I would like to take a moment to wish all of our affiliates and listeners across the country and around the world all of the best of the holiday season. And as our present to you, now that we have you all up to speed on the latest news, please sit back and enjoy one of the nation's best storytellers talk about being a kid and getting on amateur radio. Now, for your enjoyment, here is Gene Shepard, the late K2ORS, as heard on one of his broadcasts on WOR Radio in New York during the mid-1960s. Time for Gene Shepard, author, raconteur, and commentator on the contemporary scene. Here's Gene. Uh, I remember very cleanly and distinctly the, the excitement that Friday night meant. It's a fantastic, it, it always will. Uh, even to guys who are not in school, who are still not 15, uh, Friday night is a special, peculiar kind of a dangerous night. And what it meant to me, I have to, I have to admit one terrible thing uh, at, at one point in my life, what it really meant to me was Friday night was the one night that I could keep my ham station going until dawn. I did not have to get up early in the next morning. Even my paper route did not work uh, early morning Saturday. The paper was not delivered on Saturday morning. I made my collections Saturday afternoon. But I could stay up all night, and I would come. I'd come home from a date, you know, the whole scene. I'd have the, I'd have the whole bit going, and about, about ten o'clock or eleven o'clock, I'm with this girl. We're having a malt, you know. We're sitting in the drive-in watching Charlie Chan, or some other big uh, opus of the period. I'm, I'm uh, I can hardly wait, you know. I keep hearing it in my mind. I keep hearing the CQs on 40. I said, oh boy, there must be. Gee, right now, about now, the West Coast must be coming in. Right about now, the, the W6s are starting to pound into the 9th District. And here I am sitting with uh, Esther Jane, you know. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, Esther Jacob saying, gee, what, a, a penny for your thoughts. And I'd say, yeah, well, a penny for my thoughts. What was, what'd you say, what, what? She'd say, a penny for your thoughts. And I'd think for a minute, and I'd say, shall I tell her about that pie section network I was thinking of in my mind? This Pi Section Network, I got a terrific idea to change the standing wave ratio on my 600 ohm feed, on my 40, my 40 meters up. Shall I tell her about that? 
And then it would come out, you know, and I'd say, yeah, yeah, okay. And I'd say, you know, Esther, what I was thinking of, that, uh, that there is in the handbook, in the ARRL handbook, there's a terrific section on pie section networks. And I wonder if you'd like to go home with me and the two of us will build a pie section network that will reduce the standing wave ratio on the 600 ohm feeds to my 40 meter. And by that time, I'd see her drifting away. And she'd be looking out of the front window of the car now, and she's watching Charlie Chan again. I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? Just think of the fun we could have together. Y you could hold the solder, and I could take the soldering irons in. I'd say, give me the solder. Quick, 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 quick. Come on. Now put a plier down there. Hold it on that, on that terminal. Psh, oh, boy, would we have fun. And it'd be this long, fragment silence. And I recognized that, once again, I had mighty Casey had struck out. And, and I could not, I, I knew then there were certain things that you just didn't talk to chicks about. Pi section networks, you do not discuss mercury switching systems with chicks. You do not discuss a Class C final with a chick. And <laughs> you, don't, you don't even discuss the, the ineffable mysteries of the universe of that kind with a girl. And I remember one period I was, I was plunged into a profound funk, a real funk, and oddly enough, just the other night, I'm looking in the newspaper, I'm sitting there, and I'm down at the Horn and Heart Arts, you know, and I got my egg cup in front of me and a big cup of Horn and Heart Arts coffee, and I'm just casually going through the paper. And it was a paper that I found there. It was, it was on, somebody's, on somebody's table. I'm just going through it. And suddenly, Skip, a name hit me. A name just stuck right out of the headlines there. Now, you we're used to big, you know, regular names like President Johnson, Dean Rusk, and Charles de Gaulle, Mickey Mantle and stuff. It was a name? I says, no, it can't be. It can't be. And it was an obituary. And sure enough, there it was, the name of a man who probably nobody in the entire Horn and Hard Art, probably, I would say, anybody on 6th Avenue at that moment, sitting in coffee shops, sitting in H&H's, and sitting in Bickford's, wherever they might be, if I ran from one of those tables to the other and says, Look! Look! Look who died! Look at the name! Do you remember the name? The name would mean nothing to them. To how many of you does the name Heising mean anything? Did you ever hear of Heising modulation? Heising modulation. You know, there aren't many men in, in any field who give their name to an entire system or an entire uh, formula or a new discovery. You know, like the Salk vaccine. We all know the Salk vaccine. Uh, Dr. Salk's name will be familiar and will be famous for, for generations, the name Salk vaccine. We know about Freud, you know, the, the Freud dream analysis ideas and, and Dr. Freud's hypotheses and so on. We know about Einstein's theory of relativity. Well, Heising lived over here in Jersey. He died just a, just a couple of days ago. And I caught the name, and it was connected with one of the peculiar, long, blue funk moments I've ever had in my life. The Heising system of modulation is a system of AM amplitude modulation. Now, you're listening to me in most likelihood, if you're listening to 710 on your dial, I know you are, you're listening to amplitude modulation. That's AM radio. The other kind of radio is connected with another man. That's the FM radio. What's the name of the man, uh, really, who was generally credited as being, uh, being the genuine developer of FM radio? Come on, who is it? Uh, what kind of an engineer are you, for crying out? You know who it is. Why, he was, uh, there. isn't that sad? The great men of our time, hardly any, Major Armstrong. Oh, for heaven's sakes. He also was uh, involved in the, in the superheterodyne theories. That's another thing. There was a great man. But the name Heising, it, it became so mystical, so involved in my life, like a coal pits oscillator, for example. I wonder, I wonder if old man coal pits, who invented a certain type of oscillator, knew that for, for years and years and years there would be a little diagram in uh, question and answer manuals, in ARRL handbooks that would say coal pits oscillator. Now, now, I, I'm not talking to you about radio here, so don't get bored here. I'm talking to you about something else. Can you imagine your name, let's say Witherspoon or uh, Aschenschlager 
And let's say if, if, if there were textbooks to be printed for a hundred years from that, and it would say, Aschenschlager's Law of Rottenness. And forever and ever, people would know the name Aschenschlager, and it's, it's not even a, a man anymore. It's, it's just a name. It's a name. Heising was not a man to me. And I was astounded to find a Mr. Heising died. And I read the obit, and it was the one. It really was the Heising who had created this system of modulation. Well, let me tell you, uh, speaking, speaking of bad modulation, this is WOR AM and FM New York. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to go into a technical description of what the Heising system of modulation is. I could go into that. That's for next semester. Uh, we won't do that tonight, but I will, I will tell you this, that I am now on CW. See, I'm a kid. I'm about 14 years old. I'm a ham. And my whole life is, is connected with this stuff. And, and, of course, I was also involved in other things, like I'm playing football and I'm playing second base and, and I'm going out with Esther Jane Alberry and I'm going out with Don Strickland and I've got all the chicks going. You know, the whole scene is a gigantic fruitcake of existence. And connected with all of it, of course, and somehow weaving through it in, in this tapestry was this thing of back home in the front bedroom, my shack. And this was my special place, my shack. And the day bed is over here, and the, the windows are over here. And the shack was a, was a bedroom we did not use. It was my shack. And I had this old table that I had bought from the Salvation Army for a dollar. And I cleaned it, and I put formica on the top of it and polished it. I had a little vice on the side of it, you know. And I had, I had the desk drawers all cleaned out. And I had compartments in there where I had resistors and condensers. And I had all the whole thing. I had a clipboard off to the left where I kept my log sheets and, and my plate readings and my grid drive readings and all that. And I had a rack. I had a four-and-a-half-foot rack that I bought. I bought it in an old used radio store, a place where you buy old radio junk, you know. And I bought this rack. It was a big four-and-a-half-foot rack, and it had big 19, 19 and a half inch panels across it. And in it, this big four-and-a-half-foot rack, which was a great big piece of iron, I had a 10-watt transmitter. <laughs> that was the joy, the light of my life. It was CW, and every night uh, when all the other kids, you know, were sort of just hanging around the living room and walking around picking their teeth and crying and whining and looking out of the window and and the yelling down the hot air register, you know, the stuff that kids do, I would be in the front bedroom in my shack with my key. The time that Uncle Tom gave me that key, I will for forever remember. He gave me an old railroad, beautiful railroad key with a sidewinder, you know, a real key, see. And I would be down there at uh, maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and I'm on there with my cans, my Brandy's earphones hanging on my head, and I'm on 40 meters. My 6L6 is laying it down on 40, and I'm right there in the middle of the band. 7182 was my Bliley X-Cut crystal, and I am number one on 7182. And my, my rig had such poor voltage regulation, Skip, that the entire house, when I would press the key down, the lights would go, ooh, 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 ooh. and about every 10 minutes, my old man was, would come back. Well, you cut out that. I can't even read now already. I'd say, okay, Dad, all right. I'd sit there and then I'd go, wait for a couple of minutes. I'd wait till, you know, you always wait till the ripples sort of die down. And the, the talk builds up again out there. And then I go, a few little V's, you know. I am laying it out on 40. So this is my whole life. I walk around the streets with, with Esther Jane or with Helen Weathers or with uh, Dorothy or one of the chicks I was going with, and I would hear a horn. A car would go past, you see. And uh, I hear that old horn blow. You always hear this. If you're, if you're a real CW man, you hear it, and you can never get rid of it. You hear it all the time. I stand next to subway trains right now on 59th Street, and they come along, you know, and I hear the doors rattling, and, and I hear them. They say things. And coach, da, 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 da. he goes past roaring out of CQ, you know. It's the double A train. I can hear a CQ just as plain, just as plain and easy. You know? I'm walking down the street with Helen Weathers or with Dorothy Anderson, and I hear the horns. You know, the horn goes. Some guy sends a K. I turn around and go. And there's a dull silence there. And then I'd hear obscenities. I'd, I'd walk along and somebody'd send, send an obvious obscenity. He doesn't know he's doing it, you know. He'd just say, 
I dig Dorothy. I said, you hear what he said? She, she said, what? And, of course, the word got out that I was kind of a nut. You know, kids who do things that all other kids don't do are always, always kind of looked upon as the nut, the crowd. Well, about that time, it was maybe about a year after I got on CW, and uh, I was going up for my Class A examination. Now, this is a special exam that you take that involves amplitude modulation. It's about telephone, radio telephone, this whole business that we're involved in right now. Right now you and I, you're, you're listening to me on a, on a radio set. I'm talking to you on an amplitude modulation transmitter and so forth. Well, that was that whole theory, diagrams and the whole business, and there was one special section called the theory, the adjustment, and the maintenance of the Heising modulation system. And I got involved in that. Somehow I, I began to dig this system. I liked to, it had a nice had a nice symmetry about its diagrams. It was a nice somehow I dug the theory of the Heising system. <laughs> Don't ask me why, I can tell you now. One thing, it's cheaper than most other systems. And, and, and I began to dig this Heising modulation system. And then I began to go down to, uh, to the old surplus radio stores, and I began to look for chokes, filter chokes and stuff that I could build, I could use to make this Heising system. And it became almost the next big goal. You know, as we all live in our lives, uh, whatever little life we have, we have goals achieved and goals about to be achieved, and we have goals we're aiming at. All the time. So a guy may live uh, during a certain period in his life, and his, his idea is get a boat, get a boat. And he walks around the street and he thinks about boat, 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 boat. Or, or he, he, he may have this thing, uh, uh, get a promotion, uh, get to be the uh, chief clerk, get, uh, get to be the chief clerk. And he thinks about this all the time, get to be the chief clerk. Other guys have the thing, yeah, I'm going to make money on the at and I'm going to make I'm going to make dough. You see, the, the reason we, we dig horse racing uh, and... and and the stock market and that kind of thing is because you can see goals achieved and also goals failed. That's part of it. And so our, each life, each day, is a whole series of little goals. Uh, gee, if I can only get away to get a, get a cup of coffee. Holy smokes, if I can only get away to get a cup of coffee. Oh, wow, wow. And you go for about a half an hour, so you're working away there, and then all of a sudden you say, I'm going to go. I'm going to go and get a cup of coffee. And boom, the next thing you know, you're sitting down there at that good old chock full of nuts, and a coffee's out there, and a goal has been achieved. A goal has been achieved. Bing, it's big, you know. It's there, you see. And there I was beginning to develop this thing, and Heising modulation. Now, I know <laughs> this means nothing to you, but millions of hams are listening, and they're saying, yeah, man, yeah. Well, at that same time, there was a girl that I was really hung up on. I don't even remember this girl's name. It was one of those brief, momentary things, you know, where you get hung up on a chick. I remember she had dark hair, and she had sort of pink, light-type skin. And I remember she lived on the north side of town. And I remember I used to ride over there about every second day with my Elgin bicycle, like mad through the gloam, just to look at her house, you know, that kind of thing. Just to ride past her house once in a while, like, hey, ah, look out! She'd never look out. But once in a great while, I'd see her at the tennis court, that kind of thing. I had a big hang-up on this chick. And at the same time, I had a hang up on Heising modulation. Well, one day, I'm in this store, this old junky store that we used to go to. Uh, I'm, I'm down in the Ace Radio Shop. It's a crummy old, lousy radio shop. They have millions of piled up turntables of old, uh, disreputable types, you know, wound for Bulgarian capitals, special types of winding that only work on six and a half volts or some nutty thing like that, or 18 and a third volts, and all kinds of crazy equipment. And I came across the, the transformer. It was perfect for my Heising modulation. Well, I had about a dollar. That was about as much as I could go. And old Sam, back at the counter there, at the, at the Ace Radio Shop, is looking me right in the eye, and he says, A buck, are you kidding? Do you realize it's a 300 mil transformer? What are you talking about, Mac? You don't find many of them anymore. That's a 300 mil Thor Darson transformer. And I... There I'm there, confronted with it. Well, that night, I had a date. I had one dollar... This son of a gun wanted two and a half for this transformer. Now, I had a total, probably a total stake at the time, of about three bucks, of which one dollar was to go for a transformer that day, or something else. Maybe I wanted to buy it. Whatever I was going to get was going to be a buck, see. 
I figure two bucks. Well, we'll go down to the Orpheum, me and this chick. That'll leave us uh, enough to get a hamburger over at Miner and Dunn's. And, uh, well, you know, it'll work out pretty good. I'll maybe squeak by with an extra quarter or two. I had it all figured out. Well, Sam looked me in the eye. I looked Sam in the eye. And right there on that counter in front of us, it was laying right there. Now, this is the curse that all men have had to face all their time. Uh, all men I know. Is it going to be a boat? Or? <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. I don't think chicks have these kind of decisions to make quite as often as men. They may in the future. But men always have these little things, you know. They do. They have to decide whether or not to be a social animal or a rotten, crummy, selfish animal. Now, usually they, do, they devise it in such a way in their mind to be both. And so the guy will say, well, if I buy this transformer, I will be a happier person to be with. Not only that, I will be, I will be more fulfilled. And then I could certainly be able to fulfill my role with Esmeralda much. But actually, I'm, I'm investing in her if you look at it in a certain way. If you look at it a certain way and a certain light, that the best thing I could do for her would be to buy this 300 mil Thor Darson transformer and build up my Heising modulation system, and from there on in it would be hotsy totsy. That's well, that's the way my mind went. So five minutes later, I am going home with this big transformer under my oh that excitement, you know. I had all the other stuff, you know. I was all ready to go, and that afternoon I'm building and soldering getting this thing going, you know, I got it, I got the diagrams out, and I'm working down the circuit, the circuit values, and I've, I've, you know, I'm hinching a little bit, you know, I got a couple of things where it says 0.2 micro micro farad condenser, I got a 0.1, you know, little things like that, all the way down, yeah, go free, I'll make it work, you know, the, the, the resistor that it should have been, let's say, 1,500 ohms, I had one that was 2,700 ohms, uh, you know, that's it's close enough for jazz, you know. <laughs> so, well, anyway, it's now about 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, there, thereabouts. And I have built my first modulator. I don't know whether you know the excitement, friends. I, I don't know how I can transmit this to you. Of going on the air for the first time on your transmitter. Now, I'm not talking about CB. This is nothing. This is kid stuff. Come on. None of that junk. And, and by the way, many people today confuse amateurs for CBers. They're totally different animals, completely. There is no parallel between. Uh, a CBer bears about the same relationship to an amateur as a little grandmother riding along the West Side Highway in her 47 Plymouth bears to Sterling Moss. <laughs> it's about the same, isn't it? Roughly, yeah. They ain't at all the same thing. Don't confuse them at all. And so I've got this Heising modulation system all done. I've got a 6L6 tube in the final. I got a dummy load on it. And I'm all set to try it out, test the whole thing out. I got the microphone, I got a single button carbon mic, put the gain on, turn it all on. And then I, I stand back with the mic and I'm ready to go. And I've got my, I, I was using to test my modulation system, I have a 2 watt neon bulb which I could see <laughs> was about as close. And, of course, I had a milliammeter. I had an ammeter in the, in the plate and so on. And so she's heating up. Slowly, I apply the plate voltage. I had a variac, and I'm applying the plate voltage to my final. She's now up to 700 volts. That's a lot of voltage on that poor old 6L6. And she's a bright, brisk, cherry red, you know. And I said, well, maybe I'll back it down a little bit. I go down a couple of notches, and I'm now I got about 500 volts on the plate, and then I switch in my Heising modulation. And there's one moment, just a moment of pause, when suddenly, without any warning, it goes. I get this fantastic chatter in my transformer. I back it down. I look in. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I turn off the switches. Get off the diagram. I'm checking it over here. Check, check, check. check. Everything checks out. <laughs> yes, indeed. Let's see. Well, maybe I had just too much gain on the input there. Maybe she was overloading. Motor boating. That's it. She's probably motor boating. So I turn it on again. I stand back and wait. Everything in my, my 6L6 is glow, this nice cherry glow. And I turn up the gain a little bit. <coughs> hello, hello. One, two, three, four. Hello, hello. Hello. Oh, hello. Ooh, for crying out loud, I back it down a little bit. 
Hello, hello. By the way, Mr. Heising was doing this to me, in case you don't know it. The man who just passed into the great beyond over in Jersey. Hello, 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 hello. And it was the first time that I had ever encountered one of the major curses of mankind. Downward modulation. Now that means nothing to your friends. <laughs> Except suffice it to say that when old Shep talks to you here, uh, the the uh, transmitted signal of WOR goes up. As my voice goes up, the transmitter, the signal goes up. Well, my transmitter was working the opposite. As I would talk into it, it would go down. <laughs> and I'm holding the thing up there. Hello, 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 hello. And now it's getting about 7 o'clock, see. Hello, hello, one, two, three, four. Oh, what a curse. And I could not get... And, and by that time, I just said, well, there must be something wrong. I'm not checking it right, so I'll call CQ. Hello, CQ, hello, CQ, hello, CQ, hello, CQ. And I'm tuning back. Hello, I'm on 160, in case you're interested in the band. Hello, CQ, hello. And I stand by. And immediately, a guy comes back right on the frequency. Gong! W9QWN, W9QWN. Fantastic signal, W9QWN, W9QWN. This is W9XXX standing by. Do you hear me all, man? Oh, W9XXX, yeah, this is W9QWN here. You're Q5R9 plus here, old man. Handle here is Shep, S-H-E-P, Shep. Handle here is Shep, we're running a single 6L6. About uh, 10 watts, uh, Heising modulation, uh, modulated by a single 10, uh, by a single 6L6 here, and a single button carbon mic. I'm using a 40 meter zip on the harbor ladder tomorrow. Okay, W9XXX, uh, W9QWN uh, standing by. Kunk. Kunk. That signal comes back. W9QWN, this is W9XXX uh, here. I recognized him as one of the great famous hams of the area. You know, it's like talking. It's like if you're an aviation nut and all of a sudden you're hooked up with Lindbergh, you know. And you're down at the flying club and you two are discussing flying together, you know. And he comes back to me and he says, mm, uh, What did you say the uh, handle was? I don't remember working you before. I just thought I'd call you. You're messing up the band. Uh, you're you're lousing up the frequency here. It sounds to me like you've got a little downward modulation, and I don't think you're final. It, it sounds a little bit like you're a lot of parasitics there. And uh, not only that, it sounds to me just a little bit like your neutralization is way off, man. I just thought I'd call you. I didn't want to get involved in any long rag chew. Uh, you better look into it, old man. And uh, I'm going to QR, QRT now. I think I'll pull a switch, and uh, don't bother to come back. You sound rotten. Uh, don't bother. Come back, old man. Uh, it's all right, fellow. Uh, your signal here is about, I'd say, around a Q3, Q2 to 3, about an R2. Well, that meant that he had to turn up everything he had just to hear me. And when he did turn it up to hear me, I was just rotten. Uh, and so I <laughs> he just, goom, he's gone. I'm sitting. Icing modulation, eh? Yeah, I turn it on again. I take my neon bulb. This time I put the I put the, the dummy load in. See, I'm not going to radiate all over the band and I get on there. Hello, hello. Keeps flickering downward. It's now 8.30. Quarter to nine. My check has been waiting for me since seven. It's at seven o'clock. Well, I finally realize, you know, this is, this is, this is, this is, this way lies madness. In this way lies the antisocial animal. And uh, once you have committed yourself to the antisocial animal forever, you'll be down in some dank basement, surrounded by half-empty ball jars full of nails. The rest of your life will be given over to this insanity, whatever it is. I knew that even then, as an animal. I knew even then that hang-ups can devour you. And so, about quarter to nine, I looked at this thing, I says, oh. Okay. I turned it off. And 15 minutes later, I am picking up this chick. And ten minutes after that, we are on our way to the Aragon. We are on our way to <laughs> this place where they had these terrible bands and stuff, see? And all the way on up, all I could think of was downward modulation. All I could think of, it was like I had failed as a man. <laughs> I wonder, uh, it's too bad that Tennessee Williams doesn't write plays about the things that really get guys going, that really get guys hung up. I have known guys for two solid years Two solid years to be eaten up inside. I mean eaten up. Where they yell at their chicks. They threaten to kill their daughters. They, they, they take a shot at their boss because of one thing. They get rotten gas mileage. They're getting eight miles to the gallon. 
and it burns them up every time they go into that gas station. You know, they bought this monster, and it takes 14 gallons of gas just to get the town and back. <laughs> it's like it's like uh, Ahab and that and that whale, you know. And so we are on our way to the Aragon Ballroom. Well, have you ever danced with a chick? when you've got a heising system of modulation on your mind with downward modulation and also a bad problem with the par parasitics. All the time I'm hearing parasitics in my mind. And parasitics are awful things. They're like little... Uh, well, when you hear parasitics on the air, you know it. It's like a swarm of awful, angry, sort of somehow debauched, erotic locusts. They surround your signal. It's a fuzzy signal. If you could tune past WOR and it sounds like a, like a shaving brush that's been drinking, uh, that would be like my signal was on 160, and I'm bugged. Well, on the way home, after about uh, says, m at least uh, four hours of dancing, it seemed like four hours, went on endlessly, back and forth, we're going. We're on our way home, and she turned to me, and she says, I don't want to hurt your feelings. And I said, what, 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 what? I, I, already, you see, I was back in, in, in my shack. You know, I was sitting next to this chick on the Western Avenue car, but I'm already back in the shack, you know, and I've, I've got an idea. I'll tell you what it is. It must be the cathode. It must be my cathode biases. That's it, that's it. I, I, you know, I'm thinking, oh, oh boy, I can hardly wait to get home. Hardly wait to get home. I'm going to change that resistor in there. I know what it is. It's really, I know what it is. I know. Oh, what a fool, what a nut. And she says, uh, now, come on. She says, you, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you're one of the, you're one of the worst people that I've ever dated. I said, what? <laughs> um, you know, I don't make passes or anything. I'm a nice guy, you know. I took her out there. She said, you're one of the worst people I've ever dated. And she says, not only that, she says, but I think, I think that your mother ought to take you to a doctor. I think you're unhealthy. Unhealthy? It never occurred to me to be having a hang-up on a cathode follower circuit or having a hang-up on Heising modulation was somehow a perversion. It was a sickness. I said, well, unhealthy. I don't mean I play football and all that stuff. What do you mean unhealthy? Now I'm getting a little bugged with her. What do you mean unhealthy? Anybody with the kind of skin you got should holler about unhealthy, for crying out loud. She says, well, I don't care. She's bugged. Oh, a woman scorned, even at the age of 14, is, is hell on wheels. That's all i got to say. So I'm saying, well, what do you mean unhealthy? She says, well, I don't think you even talked to me once tonight. What do you mean talk? You didn't I buy an orange drink? I bought you knee high. I talk. I said I asked you if you wanted another one. I remember that. I said it was fun. I remember telling you it was fun. She said, You did not talk to me once all the time we were at the Aragon. Long pregnant pause. I said, What am I gonna to talk to you? What do you know anything about downward modulation? She says, What? I said, Well, I've got worries. I'm worried. Can't you tell I'm worried? <laughs> Nothing is worried, more worried than a guy who is building something and it hasn't worked. I can tell you this, it drives you out of your skull. I said, I'm worried. And we rode all the way home on the Western Avenue car in silence. Got to the end of the line, took her home, says goodbye. Just goodbye. That was the end of that. I took off like a big speckled bird. <laughs> I'll tell you, I didn't think of her. It's eight seconds off. I'm, ooh, over the privet hedges I'm going, you know. I'm flying all the way home with my wings going, you know. Wow. Woo, up the front porch. Boom, in. Pow, into the front bedroom. Goom, goom, goom. The switches are going on. The old man sitting out in the front room there listening to the A&P gypsies or something, you know. And I got, I got all the switches turned on, everything going, waiting for it to heat up. I got the soldering iron heating up, and I've got the solder out there, and I have got that two micro micro farad condenser which I should have put in in the very beginning in the cathode it hit me halfway through red sails in the sunset what the problem was halfway through I says I, what, what's the matter with me I got a, I got a one tenth condenser in there it should have been a two at least a two micro micro farad I'm soldering this thing up you know boy I heat this baby on there I got the microphone going dummy load alright let's see putting in a little grid drive there. Now she's, oh boy, she's doing real good. You know, whoop, whoop, ah. I tuned the final plate. Ooh, what a dip. I'm tuned in that final tank. Now, ooh. ooh. Advance the gain a little bit. Hello, one, two, oh, what a beautiful sight. What a beautiful sight. My milliameter in the final plate is ticking up. Ever so slightly. Ding, 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 ding. Up, she's, she's working perfectly. 
I take my neon bulb. Hello, one, two, three, four. Hello, 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 hello. One, two, three, four. Hello. Beautiful envelope. Magnificent signal. Pow. Out comes the dummy load. In goes my 600 ohm Zep V. Boom, boom. I'm tuning her up. Oh, man. Up to the full 10 watts. Hello, 160. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Look at that meter flicking up in there now. Look at it right behind your head, Skip. Look at that beautiful sight. Hello, hello. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Calling CQ. I sat there until I was red in the face calling CQ. This is W9QWN calling CQ and listening. I developed that real snotty way, you know. And listening, come in there, boom. I'd wait. Of course, the band was one solid mass of heterodynes. I could hear nothing. Just woo, all the big timers are coming in. It's late at night. And then finally, about one o'clock in the morning, I hear this guy calling out, oh, W9QWN, W9QWN. This is W8LFD in Cleveland, Ohio, calling. Hello, 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 W9. Oh, fantastic moment of total joy. You know how the guys who have reached the top of Mount Everest feel? I know that feeling. I know that feeling of standing on the top of a glacier, looking out over the Himalayas. Nothing but achievement. You can't go anywhere after this. There I sat that night, working guys all over the Midwest with my 10-watt Heising system of modulation. And it wasn't until there was a postscript to this. Years later, I am out of the Army. Years later, oh boy, long time afterwards, I am going through a department store. I am home about a week and a half, and I still got my uniform on. And I'm going through a department store in Chicago, and who do I meet but that girl? That same girl. And she's working in one of the big stores. In fact, she was working in Carson, in case you're interested. And there she is. And I couldn't remember the chick's name. And she couldn't remember my name. And she was behind a counter. And we both stood there and I said, say, Ham and High, didn't you go to Ham and High? She says, yes, of course, you, uh, I remember you. I said, I remember you, do you remember the, she says, yes, the Aragon. We stood there for a second. And then she finally says, you know, you were kind of a nut. Did your mother ever take you to the doctor or something? See about that? I said, no, no, that, that problem's all cleared up now. It's all cleared up. Little did she know, little did she know that the problem was all cleared up. I was getting upward modulation. You have been listening to Gene Shepard, the late K2ORS, as heard on WOR Radio in New York. Happy holidays from all of us here at This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bakaba, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Whoosh. Coming at you over to radio and the internet. I thought this was, in a some, couple of ways, a red-letter week for technology. A, a week that we may, I wouldn't be surprised if 10, 20, 30 years from now we look back on it and say, yep, that was it. That was the tipping point, the turning point, the time when everything changed. Now, I can't finish that sentence. It's either going to be for the better or for the worse. <laughs> I don't know about that part. And no, I'm not talking about Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm talking about artificial intelligence. So you may remember, I mean, that's the history of, uh, of computers playing games goes back quite a way. In fact, it was almost 20 years ago, wasn't it, that uh, Deep Blue, the IBM chess playing robot that later became Watson uh, and, and learned how to play Jeopardy. But, <laughs> but Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov, the world chess champion, and, uh, and really... Change, I mean, change everybody's opinion of what a computer could do. But I have to say that is not artificial intelligence, not the way Deep Blue was playing. In fact, some people even cried foul because they said, well, you actually trained it to play against Kasparov specifically, to have strategies and, and, and style that would flummox the world champion. That's not fair. 
Fast forward about 20 years, and a computer named AlphaGo, just, uh, was it last year or this year? I guess it was this year. For the first time ever, a computer beat the world champion in Go. It took him 20 years. Chess is fairly simple compared to Go. Go is a Japanese game that is very open-ended and very difficult. And really, although a computer can calculate chess positions so fast that it can look 20 or 30 moves ahead, Go is much more difficult to do that. So uh, that was a big deal, AlphaGo beating the world champion. But then this was a Google, a Google computer. But they weren't satisfied. The artificial intelligence uh, gurus at Google said, we're going to do more. And this week they published a paper talking about what they did next. <clears throat> they took AlphaGo and they evolved it to AlphaZero. Now, AlphaGo had been provided with many, many games of Go to learn the basics and then trained itself after that. Alpha Zero was only taught the rules. That's all. They said, here's what you're trying to do. Go have at it. You figure out how to play. It played itself millions of games a second. And within four hours, remember its predecessor took several months to train. Within four hours evolved so it could beat Alpha Go, the computer that beat the world champion of Go. And then it taught itself chess. <laughs> and after four hours, it beat the best chess playing computer, the world champion chess playing program, Stockfish. <clears throat> and then it said, <laughs> actually, I should, I have to correct myself, eight hours to beat Alpha Go, four hours to beat Stockfish. Then it said, you know, I got a little time. I got nothing else to do. Two hours, it learned a Japanese version of chess. It's actually quite fun. And much like chess, very strategic, called Shogi, and defeated one of the best computers around. So a couple of days. And here's why I think this is a watershed moment. For artificial intelligence, for computers, thinking computers really to work, they can't rely on us. They need to learn, right? Learning is key. <clears throat> we can only teach them so much. In fact, this is, I would say, almost a failed branch of artificial intelligence. For many decades, there's been a project... I don't know if it's even still going. I think it might be to just enter all the world's knowledge into a computer and hope it would just at some point go, oh, and the light would come on and it would be smart. And this has been a failure. Training computers with examples. We're doing it. Google's doing it. If, uh, if you uh, ever use, use Google Photos, which I talk about all the time and I love, you can you know type any search term in there. You could type, uh, for example, dogs. And Google Photos, having been trained now on billions of photos from all of us, has learned what a dog looks like. And we'll give you all your pictures of dogs. It'll throw a few kitty cats and wolves in there. But basically, it's pretty good. But that's that's a different kind of AI. That's an AI that's been training on real stuff. This is new. And I think this is kind of an important leap for artificial intelligence. Maybe a scary leap. I don't know. There are those, like the physicist Stephen Hawking and entrepreneur Elon Musk who say, be afraid, be very afraid. And then there are those, mostly people working in actual artificial intelligence scientists who say, no, no, no. We just unplug it if it gets uh, out of hand. No. And then there's the movies and the science fiction. And we all know what happens there. But it's really interesting because at this point, and I, and I am no artificial intelligence scientist, but at this point, it's my understanding that if you were to, you know, look into the the code that runs this new Alpha Zero, it's not human readable. It has developed its own learning. And we've already seen two computers at Google working together on a problem, developing their own language, also impenetrable to humans. So this, to me, is a week that will go down in history. And 20 years from now, we may look back and say, you know, December 2017, that's when the machines <laughs> got smart. The other reason this is of concern, at least uh, to me of concern and science fiction of concern, is because once machines can teach themselves and each other, they work at much, well, you can see at a much faster clip. To manually train Alpha Zero, Alpha Go to play Go took months of, you know, patiently feeding a game after game. <clears throat> Alpha Zero said, no, 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 I, I don't need to do that. Let me just play a whole bunch of games and I bet I'll get better and better and better, faster and faster and faster. And it did. And again, I don't, you know, maybe it's not scary. The 
people who work in this field aren't, aren't at all intimidated by this. But the notion to me that we don't know what's going on inside that black box, that computer, we can't look at it and say, oh, yeah, see how it figured that out? You can't really. It's not human readable. It's not, it's not designed for humans. That, that worries me just the tiniest bit. I don't want to, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know what there is to do about it. I think it's fascinating. And certainly, most experts say, don't worry, these will be very limited. They're dumb, really, just like all computers, uh, but they're very good in a particular realm. And this will be more and more and more useful to humans. Okay, if you say so, it's going to be good. <laughs> I, I, I have to say, I, for one, look forward to being able to talk to my Amazon Echo and have a nice conversation. Just, you know, be friend in the house. And I'm sure that will happen in my lifetime. And I'm old, so not long. 10, 20 years. You might find this interesting. This is the voice of world control. <laughs> what? I bring you peace. What? It may be the peace of plenty and content. Oh, no. Or the peace of unburied death. Oh, dear. Well, thank you. That's a Colossus, the Forbin Project. I, I, it's a shame. I think we should bring that movie back. It is a little dated. It's the 70s, but it's kind of fun. This has been the topic for movies, though, going back to the earliest uh, films, movies like R.U.R., which are about robots. And, of course, all, many modern movies uh, talk about this. That's what The Matrix was all about, the machines taking over, and the Terminator, the machines taking over. We're very afraid of all of that. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure, that's, I'm not sure that's exactly what's going to happen. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Foundations of Amateur Radio. The social aspects of our hobby are a never-ending feast of variety. Since the requirement for becoming an amateur is that you're interested, the assortment of people who arrive at our doorstep can be described as a motley crew. I once stood in a room with radio amateurs, and if I recall correctly, between us, we had a surgeon, a naval officer, a sailor, a truck driver, a hiking enthusiast, a computer professional, young and old. Some were retired, others hadn't started their careers. There were wealthy people and people on welfare, some with university degrees, others without. I participate in a weekly lunch called Prawnheads, been going for 25 or so years. The name is an acronym for the Perth Radio and Wireless Noodle House Eating and Discussion Society. We have a lunch with people from all over the place, visitors from overseas, random interstate drop-ins, new and very experienced amateurs, all mixing it together for an hour or so. If you're ever in Perth on a Wednesday for lunch at noon, you should look it up. Most of my life I've been a computer geek. Some of the time I was a broadcaster on national radio, an ultralight pilot, and I'm sure there were other phases I've skipped over. Being a sea scout comes to mind, for example. In those pursuits I found myself surrounded by different people. But the range of interests and backgrounds was never as wide as those that seem to be attracted to our hobby of amateur radio. I'm raising this because it pays to think about this every now and again. People with different backgrounds have different experiences, different expectations. They communicate differently, have different vocabularies, want and expect different things. And while the pool of amateur radio brings them into the room, the interaction with other humans is what keeps them there. I spend varying amounts of time online in various discussion groups related to amateur radio, and a vast range of communication styles is right there in front of you. Some people are brief, to the point of being perceived as abrupt, others never seem to get to the point, and in between them are the peacemakers who attempt to explain what is going on. It has been pointed out to me that I have a particular communication style that sometimes causes people to misunderstand my intent. For example, I regularly send single word emails with the word done or her, from my perspective, this is perfectly clear. You write an email for me to do something and I write back done when I'm finished, or her, when your request makes no sense to me. We are a hobby of communication, supposedly. My experience is that we're pretty good with coax, soldering iron, antennas and making a campsite, but our communication skills let us down. We're geared up for talking to people like ourselves, but when we're confronted with people from different backgrounds, Often the pitchforks, feathers and tar come out. People take offence, even when none was given. Feuds start. People ostracise each other and friendships end. I get that not all humans get on with one another, but given the same interests, amateur radio, given that we're about communication, you'd think that we'd spend a little extra effort with this. Don't get me wrong, disagreements happen all over the place. 
Amateur radio is no different, but looking at the eclectic bunch that we are, it does appear that we have more than our fair share of bullies, discrimination, acrimony and dissent, not to mention the self-appointed policemen, the armchair lawyers and those subject matter experts. I recently pointed out to a new member of our community that amateurs are, in the words of Douglas Adams, mostly harmless. At this time of the year, I think it's a good idea to spend a few moments to consider if something you said or did could be learned from and improved. I'm sure I'll fail spectacularly on regular occasion, but I do know that I'm never intending to do harm, and perhaps that might be a good motto for our hobby. Do no harm. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. Some Christmas mumbo jumbo will wing its way to you in five. I'm Will Rogers, K5 WLR, with this rain report for Christmas week 2017. We do have some exciting news from the Dayton Hamvention this week. However, first things first. We wanted to bring you a very rare rain report that consisted of the reading of a piece called A Ham's Christmas that was penned by the late Walter A. Tompkins, K6ATX, voiced more than 25 years ago for the rain report by Chicago ham and broadcaster Oren Brand, K9KEJ. A Ham's Christmas by the late Walter A. Tompkins, K6ATX. Twas the night before Christmas, and in the ham shack was the warm glow of tubes in the transmitter rack. The logbook was brought up to date with great care in case the FCC might someday be there. XYL and harmonics were snug in their beds. No Tennessee Indians to addle their heads. I plugged in the mic and my new VFO getting all set for a nice QSO. When from the relays there rose such a clatter, I yanked the big switch to see what was the matter. Then up on the roof, by the two-meter beam, there came QRM like a heterodyne scream. On Gonset, on Babcock, on Viking, and Elmac, on Ranger, on Collins, on Heathkit, and IMAC. Bias to the grid and bolts to the plate. Just watch that S-meter while we all modulate. As I turned on the rig and reached for a dial, from the antenna tuner, Santa slid with a smile. An RF choke he held tight in his teeth, coax encircling his head like a wreath. A bundle of ham gear he had flung on his back. Was that my name on a new power pack? He had a stub nose like an egg insulator, and his cheeks glowed bright red like a hot oscillator. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, laying out all the gear, then turned with a jerk, and laying the wave meter alongside his nose said, Please QSL, and up the feeders he rose. He climbed up that dipole, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like a jet-propelled missile. But I heard his last signal from the ionosphere. 73! 88! And a happy new year. Now this regarding the 2018 Dayton Hamvention scheduled for next May. We are pleased to announce the Greene County Commissioners and the Greene County Fair Board have approved the construction of a new building at the Fairground Expo Center. Greene County officials have decided to move forward with construction of a new building as it will continue to expand their presence in the region as a world-class exposition center. Invention certainly benefits from the decision to expand the Expo Center footprint. Construction is planned to be complete ahead of Hamvention 2018 and will be used for the event. Additionally, another building on the property, previously known as Fairgrounds Furniture, is being vacated and will be available for use by Hamvention 2018. More details regarding the building sizes will be forthcoming, but Hamvention is told the floor space added will cover an area larger than the tents Hamvention used in 2017. 
Although this decision was made to expand opportunities at the Expo Center, Hamvention is grateful for the support of Greene County, Xenia Township, and the City of Xenia. This press release is signed by Ron Kramer, General Chair, Jack Gerbs, Assistant General Chair, Michael Coulter, CFO, Official Spokesperson, Hamvention. For more information regarding Hamvention, point your web browser to http colon forward slash forward slash hamvention dot org. That's http colon forward slash forward slash h a m v e n t i o n dot o r g. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. And finally this week, radio amateurs are always trying to stretch the limits of the hobby. Here are a few examples. David Bowman in G0MRF reports that he and Dave Riley, AA1A, have completed what is believed to be the first transatlantic contact on 630 meters since the MF band was released to the U.S. radio amateurs this past fall. They used JT9 digital mode to complete more than 5,160 kilometer, approximately 3,200 miles contact during the early hours of December 23rd. On the UKN, G0 MRF was running a modified ICOM 7300 with a filtered preamp and a 60-watt amplifier to a 250-foot wire configured as an inverted L. AA1A benefited from his near-Atlantic coast location in Marshfield, Massachusetts, Bowman said. Elsewhere, Dex Meyer, W4DEX, continues to extend the limits of what is possible at VLF by achieving two significant results at 8.270 kHz. A record transatlantic message length of 42 characters resulted from an overnight transmission on December 25th and 26th, received by Paul Nicholson in Todd Morden, UK. The distance covered was 6,194 kilometers, or approximately 3,840 miles, and the information rate of 24.6 bits per hour was reported to be about 70% of the channel capacity. The following night, a three-character message QRZ from W4DEX was received in Cumiana, Italy, by Renato Romero, IK1QFK, achieving a new world record distance of 7,173 kilometers, which is approximately 44,447 miles, for a message decoding at VLF. The signal to noise ratio on the Italian end was in the order of negative 70 dB. W4DEX operated with an ERP of just 100 microwatts. The mode used was EBNOT. BPSK with transmitter and receivers phase locked to a GPS derived time signal. McIntyre needed no license to transmit in that region of the spectrum. Since the FCC has not designated any allocation below 9 kHz, a region known as the Dreamers Band. In June 2014, running on the order of 150 microwatts ERP, W4DEX transmitted the first sub 9 kHz transatlantic message by radio amateur, also detected by Nicholson. W4DEX and IK1QFK already hold the world record distance for VLF signal detection, and its latest result extends that to message decoding. In Newfoundland, Inveterate VLF experimenter Joe Craig, V01NA, has been transmitting the letter S using EBNOT starting at 2100 UTC each evening on 8.270075 kHz. Craig told the ARRL, that the very low power signal has been copied in England, Germany, Poland, Russia, and Italy, where the guy who sent the first S across the pond was born. Craig quipped, I wonder what amazing things the new year will bring. Many of the news and information items heard on this week in amateur radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, amateur radio newsletters from around the world, sources on the internet, and the packet bulletin board systems of the United States and Canada. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the W0GMM repeater on 147.285 MHz in Grove, Oklahoma as part of the Amateur Radio Information Net, Monday evenings at 7 p.m.
This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly Amateur Radio Bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.